Yes, Lord. One thing that has been thrust upon you by people, mm. you know, because of your album cover, because mm -hmm. of the way you conduct yourself, people mm -hmm. have gone like, wow, she is so brave. She's mm -hmm. so confident in her body and the way she looks, and this is so beautiful and so yes. brave. But I've, I've been interested in how you've, you, you've really dismissed it and been like, no, I'm not doing this for your brave label. Yeah. I'm just me. What does that mean? Well, you know what's interesting is before the term body positive was this kind of like mainstream thing, I was just making music about my body that was positive. You know what I'm saying? Right. I was had a song called I'm In Love With Myself and I put that out in like 2015 and I was performing it on stage and it would shock people. They would be like, oh my God. How, how dare she, or wow, she's so brave, or is she, is she serious? Does she really love herself? And I'm like, why y'all asking all these damn questions? Like, what are you questioning about me and my body and right. my love for myself? You not me, you want me to hate myself? And I think that it's so interesting that now body positivity is like this buzzing term. There's no term for body negativity because it's the norm, it's what we expect. So. At this point, I realized that my mere existence is a form of activism, especially in the body positive community. And I wear that hat really well with, or not wear the hat at all, according to this book. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I wear nudity well, and I wear my body and my skin well, so I'm just gonna continue to be that, but I, I'm nobody's celebrity totem. There's, you can't make an example out of me. I'm literally here making music so I can live a more positive, healthier, happier life, and if that changes the world one song at a time, then so be it. Are you kidding me? When someone looks at your life, you know, it, it seems like the kind of life where one minute everything changed overnight. But, but it seems like, you know, Bad Bunny that we know was inspired by Benito who grew up in life going, Yeah, of course. You know, I do the things that I want to do. I believe in certain things and I aim for them. And that, that's what got you to where you are today. Beyond just the music you make, what do you think it is about you that makes you so successful? Um, I think the there's a very important um, detail and is that I, I, I'm, I'm the same guy. I'm real, you know, I, I, I don't want to be like a, like a character. Oh, right, right, right. You yeah. know, for that is Narcos, you know? So in, in my music, it's, it's Benito, it's Bad Bunny is Benito. There's no difference mm -hmm. between, between Benito and Bad Bunny. So I think that people can, um, feel uh, conectarse, identificarse yeah, yeah. Con, con, con mi música. So that's the, the key of my, what I think. Like know? they connect to the authenticity in your music. Yeah. They feel who yeah. you are. And, they and feel me, they right. feel my feeling, they feel my, what I'm saying. And is, is my magic, what I think. Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's the fact that you're not just real, but you're not afraid of being real. And, and even in your music, in your style, we've seen so much of that. Like, you've broken the idea of what machismo even is, you yeah. know? Bad Bunny comes out, is like, yo, I'll paint my nails. I'll wear whatever fashion I wanna wear. I'll, I'll break and make trends. You know, the way, the way you've treated women, the way you've spoken about women, the way you've, you've spoken about people from the LGBTQ community, whether it's gay, trans, whatever. Bad Bunny goes like, hey man, these are my views and this is my music. And I think it's broken a lot of what people think music should or wouldn't be like where did that come from yeah especially from from my music from my journey the reggaeton uh, it's like rap hip-hop is so machista so yeah. like you said um i just trying to to unify you know every people like every person every every everybody can uh feel comfortable with my music definitely with my with my videos can feel com comfortable in, in the concerts you know like create a space when uh, where everyone can feel comfortable I love with that the music it's, it's, it's what I what I try I mean selling out the O2 arena in London selling out um, you know the forum in Hollywood now the first Nigerian artist to ever sell out Madison Square Garden. And to play it as well. Well, you know one thing, you know one thing I always wondered, like, yeah. why, why, how come when it's me, they always point out the, the fact that I'm the first to do it, like, like the first that landed on the moon. <laughs> 
You feel me? You... It's like why why when rock bands perform in in Tokyo and stuff, they don't say the first American rock band to perform in Tokyo. I think because they they're surprised. There is an element of surprise, you know. But why? Because we've come a long way. Do you know how far Madison Square Garden is from Africa? Yeah, but like, do you know how far away Tokyo is for the for kids yeah, and? But, but you see, that's the thing. If you think about it, culture has for such a long time been defined by America, and so it makes sense in right, a way for right. people to go like, of course the music's gonna go there, of course so the comedians are gonna to go there. Course, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but now think about it. Things are like to, to move to... on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but think about it, right? Yeah. For. For, for the world to change the way it has, I mean, you, you, you see Beyonce incorporating your music into her vibe. Do you get what I'm saying? These are big things that have never happened. And it's beautiful. Like, everyone's, everyone's I mean, if I was her, I would incorporate my music into her vibe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every time, what I love speaking to you is every time I see the biggest difference between Nigerians and almost every other African is that like every other African has like a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a very timid approach to life. Like literally, with, like if you say to like a South African, hey Trevor, you're doing well, how are things going? Then as a South African, my, my instinct to respond is like, ah, I'm trying, man, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay, I'm trying, you know? Like, you're like, lying. You see, you see, this is what I mean by Nigerians. This is what I mean. No, no, but this is what I mean. So, mm. and everywhere, you go to Kenya, everything. How, how are things? That's the thing, uh, we, no, we don't lie unless we want to scam you. <laughs> I want to say this. Okay, with the tour, yeah. Yeah, so with the tour, we rise by lifting others. It's basically me not only bringing myself to, to the America, also bringing everything else, African food, African fashion. This was done by an African designer. On the tour, you're only and, wearing African designers, yes, right? Yes, my cast beats. I'm only wearing African designers. I'm only eating African food. I'm having African chefs come in, do food backstage. Wow. African dancers. So wow. it's not just only me. So we're coming together, we're rising, we're taking everybody wow. with us. Man, that is a beautiful message. Thank you. And yet you brought me no jollof <laughs> to the show. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it next time. We'll uh, talk about man. it next time. One of my favorite introductions I've ever heard you give is you said, hi, I'm Jesse Reyes and I write sad songs. <laughs> is that how you see yourself? Pretty much, yeah. I write a lot of sad songs. But it's, it's not like someone play like a little violin or something. <laughs> it's, it's just, I just happen to get more motivated to write when I'm sad. I write happy songs, they're just few and far in between. Right. Mm -hmm. But you, 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 you're, you're, the songs that you've released so far, you know, because we're still waiting for the album, which is going to be coming out, but the songs that you've released might have a sad tone to them, a sad feeling, but it's, it sometimes feels like there's, there's always a, an undertone of love. There's always, there's always like a dream that you're going for. There's always, there's always a feeling of hope in the music itself. Is, is that something that you've saved for the album and then like you write fun songs for other people? I guess that's funny. Um, sometimes, sometimes when I make songs for others, it's kind of like if I made a sweater. You know, and I knit this beautiful sweater and I'm like, oh, it's nice. And I try it on and I'm like, this doesn't fit right, you right. know? And then I give it to somebody else and it fits them perfect. But it might be happy. Like, I've given away sad songs too, but I feel like in life when you're conscious of the fact that like highs and lows, black and whites, up and downs have to exist, then sad songs have a little bit of love and even love songs have a little bit of sadness because you know that that love can't last because can't last, nobody gets out of love alive. Like, we have to, you know? I know. It's Oof. <laughs> Wow, nobody gets out of love alive? Well, no, because it... Well, what is love, the coronavirus? <laughs> wow, Jesse, you just like, you just took us on that, like, do you really believe that? Well, like, well, yeah, because think about it. If I mean, it's, listen. <laughs> if, you, if you fall in love and you're lucky and you happen to be that minority that finds the love of your life. Uh -huh. And statistically, no, like statistically, someone's gonna cheat. We've got Instagram, we got Tinder, we got all this BS that's like catered to lying to somebody or catered to finding quick love right, right, and right. not what you work for. So suppose you, you get by all that and you find the love of your life and you guys are down for each other and nobody lies and you make it till you're old and gray, which is beautiful. Eventually somebody has to die. That's like the truth of human life. 
somebody so has to so die. So you don't survive love. You don't survive love, but you know what though? If you keep that in mind, then today you might not cheat. If you know that tomorrow's your last day, then today you might not be a jerk. Today you might be authentically yourself. Today you might confess something. If you know that tomorrow it could be all over. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm such a big fan of yours, and I'm so excited for this new album. Uh, what's weird to me is the, the first time I met you was in Russia. Russia, yeah. Which is very... We were both there for the World Cup. Yeah. It's very strange. Like, I'm in Russia, and <laughs> I turn around, and I'm not expecting to see anybody who is black. And... <laughs> And then I'm like, wow, that guy looks like Nas. And it was you, do you, you enjoy it out there? Was that, I, was that your first World Cup? It's my first World Cup and yeah. uh, first time in Russia. I didn't know at the time, though, that you were planning to drop an album. You didn't tell me, you didn't even like slip it in. You didn't like, you know, just give me the inside scoop, no? I didn't even know. It, it, it just, it was, we was working on it for a couple of years. And um, I, I, I really didn't know what to do with these songs because they weren't really the songs that I wanted to put on the record. So right. they were just sitting there, and I always thought like I'd come back to them and finish them up later, but it never happened. So I'm sitting here with all these songs start to pile up, and I'm like, oh, I did a Lost Tapes album 17 years ago. Right, right I think right. it's time to, for another one. Yeah, but Lost Tapes was one of the most iconic albums where people said like, oh, Nas came out with this music that, you know, was a collection of ideas, and you put it together. It is an interesting idea as a musician to say, these songs didn't have a space on an album, but I still love what I've created. I'm still trying to do something different. And so it's, it's, it's a mix which some people actually enjoy more because it has such a varied right. sense. When people listen to it, is there an order for a lost tape? Do you, just, do you just like play the songs? Does it matter? Is it like five, no. seven, two, three, one? Doesn't like... No, no, you just play them. You kind of you kind of got to guess like, what year did he make this? Oh, that's nice. It's like a guessing game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some of the songs are like 10 years old, 12 years old, and some of them are like as early as like a year and a half ago. That's dope. You are seen as a music mogul now. You're seen as a businessman. But I'm interested in some of the things that you started doing that people don't expect. For instance, like you're going on tour now with yeah. Mary J. Blige, and that's exciting. Yes. Right? People are really excited about that. It's an honor. It's that's, an honor. I'm a huge fan of Mary J. Blige, so yeah, it's an honor. The royalty tour, check it out. That's gonna be yeah. insane. Yeah. And then you are you were part of a hip hop museum. Yeah, we we um hope to break break ground on that this year. We plan to build it in the Bronx by 2022. Is it interesting for you to look at hip hop? and how it's changed because some rappers came into the game when hip hop was completely, you know, bona fide and people were like, yeah, it's, it's mainstream. Yeah. You've seen the change from being considered hoodlums on the side to the mainstream. Now, did you ever think that hip hop would get to this point? I thought it, but I didn't know it would be reality. You know? right. But I, I did, I was hopeful that it would turn out to be this way and that I would be around to see it happen. And thank God I am because it's a great time. Right. It's a great time to be a hip hop artist. A hip hop it's... artist, uh, a mogul, uh, part of a museum, going on tour, and one of the most interesting aspects of your life right now is you are releasing a children's book. Yeah, called I, I Know I Can. Yeah. Yeah. That is a completely different... Now that I didn't see happening. <laughs> that, I didn't see that one. but. I do have a song, it's an important song in my catalog called I Can. So, um, you know, I'm into education for kids. You know, I have two kids, so I want, I want to see the best for our kids out here. So putting together this book, I'm still writing it. So right. it'll be out this year. You know what I'm excited about the most is there's going to be now another generation that's going to grow up and be like, oh, Nas, yeah, man, one of the greatest children's books writers of all time. <laughs> and be like, you heard he raps? He'd be like, he raps? Right. It's going to be amazing. Thank you so much uh, for being on the you. show, my dude. I remember as a kid, yep, yep. there were books that my mom got me. She couldn't afford to buy me like just books. So we had like a, like a layaway program where my mom could give a little money and they would send us literally one book a month. That's all we could afford, one book, one book. And I remember the, one of the biggest series that changed my life was, it was a book, it was called What It Means To Be. And we'd get these books once a month and my mom would sit with me and be like, what it means to be kind what it means to be loyal, what it means to be a good friend, what it means to be caring, what it means to be funny, what it means, it was just like, just, and I will never forget those lessons. And I, I got a similar feeling going through what Kid Nation is all about. And I appreciate that from you, man. Cause I was like, 
We take for granted how shaping the kids, as you said, you can teach kids to hate, but are we gonna take the time to teach them to love? So I appreciate you for that, man. Listen, man, those words coming from you, especially, you have no idea how much that means. Um, you know, I, I just, it's all about legacy for me right now. And you just stamped that approval and all the hard work that I've been doing with all these different people, just by saying and stating what you just said. Forgive me for going back to this, but like, let's, Let's go back to that video and let's go back to that moment. A lot of people saw this video where Indy Ari came out and said, hey, here's this Joe Rogan N-word compilation where he's saying this and here's him telling a joke, you know, about black people being apes. And, and you gave what, what I felt was a really impassioned uh, plea in and around how you as the artist have contributed to creating the platform that this person is on, but the platform is not rewarding you, they're rewarding that person. And what people lost in the conversation was you asking or arguing more about the power you have in the platform that you're part of creating as opposed to canceling or wiping out Joe Rogan's uh, podcast. So I would love to know, when, when, you put that, when you put that Joe Rogan video out, what were you hoping would happen or what did you think would happen? I have to say that asking for my music to be pulled from Spotify in protest doesn't actually serve me. Because now my music if things work out the way I want, my music won't be heard on the biggest streaming platform. But I did it in protest just because I felt like my dignity was being, I felt like I was being disrespected. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think, and there's a long conversation about that, about not being heard in the industry, not being respected in the industry for not just me, a lot of people, especially artists of color, especially women of color in the industry. Right. And so I was just, I just thought, the only way to affirm my dignity and my integrity is to be honest about how I feel. So I asked to just take it down. I didn't expect anyone to listen because I'm used to this certain type of treatment from the industry where they don't listen. They don't right. listen to what I say in the songs. They don't listen when I say that there's mistreatment. They, they don't listen. I say it, but they don't listen. And so um, to be honest, that made it easier to say over the years because I'm like, well, I can say whatever. And some people are here and some people <laughs> won't, you know, I mean, just being honest. And so right. when I was sitting on my couch that day and I made the decision to just say that I wanted my music off, I certainly didn't think it was going to lead to all this. And so, but um, integrity is big here for me. Right. And so being the same person I am inside as the one I act like outside, it made me have to, it made me have to speak up. But also when I am invited into conversations like this that are a bit uncomfortable for me because I sing about this, but I don't really talk about it much. Yeah. Um, I'm willing to show up for it because this is what the world did with the conversation. And all I can do is do my best to express, but I certainly thought it would be easier because I thought they would go, okay, take her off. All right, go ahead, take her off. And then I had to fight to get it off too. I'm still in a fight to get it off. Over the past 10, 15 years, we've noticed John Legend shift from being John Legend just on the keys to John Legend out in the streets. We've seen John Legend fighting for incarcerated people to not have to spend time behind bars because they can't pay bail. We've, we've seen John Legend fighting for, for people's rights, for voting rights. We've seen yeah. John Legend. This shift has, has, has become more and more aggressive over time in a good way. Yeah. I, I'd love to know where that came from. Like, how do you go from singing love songs to going like, no, you know what? I'm also gonna get out there in the streets and, and fight for these things. Well, it came from all the artists I looked up to because I looked up to people like Paul Robeson and Nina Simone and Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye. Interesting. Artists okay. who always use their platform to tell the world what was going on, not just in their music, but also going out there and funding uh, protests uh, like Harry Belafonte used to do, going out and marching with people like they used to do, singing at these protests like Mahalia Jackson used mm -hmm, to do. Mm -hmm. These were artists that I always looked up to. And when I was 15, I even wrote an essay. Uh, it was a Black History Month like essay competition. I wondered if this was true. Yes, and it's true. I wrote this when I was 15, and they said, how are you gonna make black history? In my essay, in 500 words or less, I said, that I'm gonna become a successful artist, I'm gonna become a musician uh, and, and do what I love, which is making music, but I'm also gonna use the platform that I gained from becoming a successful musician to try to make change in the world. You know, I went through this period after I got sober, uh, a little over eight years ago, where the person that I used to be, I looked back on him with a lot of uh, judgment and a lot of disdain. 
And it took me a good six and a half or seven years before I felt like I could be friends with that guy again, mm. before I felt like that was safe, you know, because I didn't want to forgive myself too quickly for fear of turning back into the person that I used to be. Finally, in the last couple of years, for whatever reason, um, I felt comfortable looking back at the music that I made then and the relationships that I made then and the person that I was then and, uh, you know, revisiting that, going and sitting down and sort of having a conversation with that person and not just hating his guts anymore because it was safer to do that. So right. once I started thinking of those things and those people, then a lot of uh, memories came back and, and sometimes in the form of ghosts, um, you know, they came back to me in a way that I'm more equipped now to write about than I was 10 years ago when I was a falling down drunk and only had a couple hours a day when I could be productive. You know, now I can use the, the writing skills and the focus that I have to make music that that guy wanted to make 10 years ago, but wasn't capable. You also show a side of yourself that many artists wouldn't show. I was, I was watching this and I was like, man, I didn't know and I never would have thought that Jay Balvin struggles with anxiety before going on stage. I would have never thought that you're having mild panic attacks when, when you're thinking about doing this. Why did you choose to share that with the people and, and how have you coped with that as a human being? It's, it's like lottery, you know, like there's people that come with anxiety and it doesn't have that something trigger. Depression is not being sad. You know, depression, it's a chemical disbalance in your brain that is way more powerful than you. I I never thought I was going to be medicated. I thought I used to be like going to the psychiatric just for crazy people. Hell no. You know, until it's been 10 years taking medication, you know, and I wasn't like, I haven't heard the first person that is looking to feel bad. You know, like, oh, mm. I wake up. Mm. I want to feel bad today. No. When you write the music, you put a lot of effort into it. And yet, I, you know, I always read these reviews about you where people make it sound like you just have these diary entries and then you sing them to a tune. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes it like they'll, they'll write about you like, oh, yeah, what Mitski does is she just has a day and then she sings about, dear diary, <laughs> yeah. you know? But, you, but you, you actually work these ideas out. You try and craft you know, a story that, that you weave through the album. Yeah. Do, you, do you wish there was a way that people would know that you're doing that? Or, or do you like the fact that some people feel like it's just free flowing and, and easy going? Uh, it's so gendered, you mm -hmm. know? I don't think I would get as many um, critiques where people say my music is confessional or raw if I wasn't who I am. Right. And I think there, uh, there is so much effort um, in like taking away my authority or autonomy over my own music because it's coming out of my own brain and I have control over my own brain but for some reason <laughs> for some reason people really need to imagine me as some sort of vessel or vessel for emotion or like vehicle for music instead of the creator.